What's coming up? As a church, we love to stay connected. One way we do that is through social media. You can find Fellowship Asheville on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And for all things Fellowship, you can visit our website at fellowshipashville.com where you can watch past messages, discover the latest on our events, and more. And one of those things is an event coming up on Sunday, March our next Discovery Lunch. And so if, you are, if you're newer to fellowship and you want to know what the next steps are to get involved or even who we are as a church, we'd invite you to register online, come hang out, eat some lunch uh, with some of the staff members here and have a chance to dig deeper into fellowship and what this church has to offer in community. Speaking of community, there's a big event coming up this weekend. Phoebe, tell us about Friday night. Families, we have a free family event you won't want to miss. This Friday, we're having a pizza and movie night. Pizza will be served at 6 in the Fellowship Hall. At 6.30, we'll move to the party to the worship center for the movie and popcorn bar. To help us plan, we ask that you register to come through our website. So, question. What is your favorite pizza? Meat lovers. And I have... At this uh, popcorn bar, there's going to be some things to be adding into your popcorn, like candy and other things. So what is your favorite thing to put in popcorn? I love M&Ms and Skittles. All right. Skittles and popcorn. Sounds like a uh, lovely uh, dental hygiene there. So um, go ahead and stand with me. I'm going to pray for us as we, as we gather together to worship this morning. Father, thank you for inviting us into this sanctuary, into this worship center, to be your church this morning. Lord, thank you that we have gathered here uh, from all different areas and different mornings. But Lord, I pray that as we gather together, as we worship you through our voices, as we worship you through the hearing and preaching of your word, God, that you may unite us together as believers. Lord, thank you that we have the freedom to worship you, that we have the freedom to love you without persecution. And so, Father, I pray that as we draw together as a community this morning, that you may be glorified in all of that we do and say this morning. For we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody, let's take a second as we uh, get ready to worship. Let's just take a minute and just uh, close our eyes and let's think about uh, this week. Maybe take inventory of your, your body right now. Take a few deep breaths and maybe you feel a little tightness in your shoulders or, or maybe... Uh, Maybe coming in this morning, just getting to church, being in here. Maybe you feel a little, a little more freed up. Maybe you're excited. Maybe you're a little nervous being here. Maybe, maybe coming to church carries with it some, some experience and some hurt. Maybe this week was just really hard. You got bad news. Or maybe you've spent the weekend celebrating something exciting. But as we take some breaths and we remember that, that we are humans created by a loving Father, we think about the words that Paul wrote where he said, we have this treasure, the, the Holy Spirit, God's breath in us, but in these jars of clay and these broken bodies that hurt. And our prayer and our hope that as we gather here today, that it's a little taste of what's to come as Jesus comes back and finally makes all wrong things right. We've experienced it now. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. And we know that we ourselves have experienced what it means to be resurrected with Jesus into a life like his. And so as we sing this morning, let's remember that. Maybe you need to lift your hands with your palms open to Jesus just to ask him to make his presence and his grace and his love real to you right now. Maybe this is the first chance you've had just to experience that this week. But as we go into worship, Jesus, we love you. This is your church, and we are your people. And we're here to serve you because we know that with you, Jesus, there is fullness of forgiveness and redemption so that we can serve you with love. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
bring it all to peace the storm surrounding me let it break at your name still call the sea to still the rage in me to still every Jesus, we lift your name today because you allowed yourself to be lifted on a cross to pay the penalty for our sins so that not only 
can we be justified, but Jesus, you were raised from the dead, conquering our ultimate enemy, death. And now we're able to experience life, that we can live in the light as you are in the light, that we no longer have to walk around as children of darkness at odds with our heavenly Father, but we can live as sons and daughters of the King of the universe, the creator and sustainer of all life. And it's because of the name Jesus that we're here today. And it's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, y'all may have a seat. Good morning. How is everybody? Good. My name is Fred. I get to be the lead pastor here. And um, I do want to give a special hello to our disciple makers from Penn State. Um, Thank you. Thank you. And uh, a special thank you, too, for sitting in the back and forcing our regulars to come forward. Thank you. You're welcome back next week if you want to, just, just for that. Because there's people up here I haven't seen ever. Like, like this is great. This is great. Um, uh, here's, here's what I've been praying for today. Um, I've, I've been praying for, well, first of all, my voice. You notice it's a few octaves lower. Like if we get real serious, I can... I can go pretty low. It's nice. That's also why there's tea up here. Um, uh, I've been praying for that. So if you want to say a prayer for that, that'd be great too. I'd love to have a voice for the entire message. That'd be great. But I've been praying for um, something that's common to all of us that we'll find out here in just a minute. But specifically, I've been praying when we reach that point, when, when this thing that's common to all of us happens, uh, we will know how to respond vastly different at the end of uh, going through our text today than we do right now. That we'll have a very clear way to respond, right? And so, so, so let, me, let me just kind of let the little, little spoiler, let me tell you what it is. Like, let me ask you a question. When do you reach your limit? Right? When do you reach your limit? Has it been today already? Right? Right? When do you find that you really can't handle anything else? Right? I'm, I'm assuming that's common to everyone, is it? Has everybody been there? Maybe, maybe for parents in the room, right? It's been maybe when uh, the kids have been a little much um, all day long, and then when it's time for bed, they don't actually sleep. Right? Remember that? Those parents who have had little kids, remember the, the little pitter-patter down the hall when you're supposed to just hear deep breathing from the bed and maybe a little bit of snoring, right? Like, like, like you're not supposed to hear the pitter-patter of little feet. Or maybe, maybe uh, for our older parents, parents of teenagers, maybe it's when your teenager just can't seem to get a break. Right? Maybe it's when school's hard for them, life is hard for them, and for some reason they want to take it out on you. Or their other siblings, right? Students, maybe, you know, let me know if this has ever happened. Have you ever had a week where you've had, like, multiple test projects due, like one of those weeks, and then your car breaks down? Or that's the week that your boyfriend or girlfriend decides to break up with you in the midst of that. Like, have you ever been in a situation where it's just been too much. Speaking of car breaking down, have you ever had one of those weeks where your car breaks down, maybe your water heater breaks down and the roof leaks all in the same week? Right? Or work, has your boss added one more thing to your plate and your plate's been full since like 2017? Right? Maybe it's not these circumstances outside of you that cause you to meet, reach your limits, but maybe it's what's happening inside of you. Maybe you've been praying for a godly spouse for a long time, and, and you can't even get a date right now, right? And, and the possibility of that prayer being answered seems so far away. Or maybe you've been praying for a sin or a temptation to go away, and yet it's still there. You still find yourself struggling with it. Right? You're being faithful to Jesus, and yet the temptation and the sin is still there. You see, all of us have these and so many more right? that can bring us to the place where we reach our limits. And here's the deal. It makes us look to heaven and say, God, can I please just have a break? Does that feel familiar? So what do we do when we reach our limits? Well, we'll be in Mark chapter 14. 
Go ahead and open your Bible there. We'll be covering 20 verses today, verse 32 through 52. And here's what we've seen as we've been going through the book of Mark. We actually started Mark right after Easter last year, and we'll finish it up at Easter. uh, Because like I said, spoiler alert, the ending of Mark goes great with Easter, right? And so, so, so we're going to finish it up at Easter, but we've seen the segments of Mark. We've seen this first segment of Mark where we get to see who Jesus is, right? And we see him heal and, 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 and feed 5,000. We see him do all this public ministry and public miracles, and it's absolutely incredible. And then Mark shifts us in the middle of this letter to see, like, if Jesus really is the Messiah, the Savior of Israel, the, the Messiah of Israel, the Savior of the world, what does it mean? And now in, in this section of Mark, as we've gotten here we've seen time slow down right because we're going day by day through the last week of Jesus's life before his crucifixion and resurrection and we're seeing what Jesus actually did during that week today we get to see betrayal become a reality you know last week they were having dinner together and Jesus said one of you here is going to betray me and Judas left we get to see what happens We get to see Jesus and his disciples reach their limits, which is really cool, and we get to learn from them. And I'm going to tell you this right now. We get to learn what we can do, and we get to learn what we probably usually do. And Jesus is going to show us what we can do, and the disciples, I'm going to bust through that stuff because, y'all, it is really familiar. It doesn't need a whole lot of preaching, all right? So go ahead and look at verse 32. So chapter 14, verse 32, says this. Okay, it says, and they went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. All right, so like I said, they just had dinner together. Judas has left to to betray Jesus, but here's what's interesting. The disciples don't know why Judas left, because remember what Jesus said. Jesus said, the one who dipped the the bread with me, like he's the one that's going to betray me, and they all did. Like I said, it's like at a Mexican food restaurant, when if somebody were to say, yeah, the person that dipped their chip in the salsa is the one. And everybody looks at each other and like they have salsa just hanging down to their mouth. And it's like, me? And that's why the disciples were like, wait, is it me? Is it me? Is it you? Is it me? And so Judas gets up and leaves. And the disciples don't know what he's doing because they don't know yet that Judas is the one that's going to betray them. And so Jesus takes the disciples and he goes to this place called Gethsemane. And Gethsemane means oil press. It means place of separation. Right, because it's where they would they would place the olives and they would press it in there. They would make oil, right? And here's why this is important: because when we meet our limits, this is what it feels like, doesn't it? It feels like we're in this press, being pressed and pushed on from every side, right? And and here's what's happening when olives are being pressed, because you can get something really good for, from it, and you can get something really bad. And nasty from it. Because here's the deal. When you, when, you, when you press an olive, you get what? Olive oil. Right? How many of you got olive oil in your kitchen right now? Right? Because it's a good thing to have. It, you can cook with it. Back then they used it to light lamps. They used it to, to light lamps in the, in the temple. Like it was a place where, where, where worship happened. And it was that olive oil that would, that would be used. And so it was this very, very good thing. But, but here's what else you get. After the olive is pressed and the, and the, and, and the olive oil is, is, is collected, then you get like this olive mush. And y'all, I'm not talking tempanade here, right? Like, like it, is, it is nasty. And it's so nasty, they can't even tur- drop it into the soil. Like you would think, well, just throw it to the ground and it'll fertilize. No, what happens is it kills stuff at that point. So what they have to do is they have to put it with the, the animal feed. Because, it, get this, this stuff has to go through an animal's digestive tract to be useful, right? Like, literally, you see this olive press, and, 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 and it can be this thing that produces something good or something that has to be digested, and the best thing it's going to turn into is manure, right? Right? Now, here's the deal. When we meet our limits, it can produce something really good, Or something of waste was the nice way to say that. Right? Because that's what it does. Look at verse 33. And he took with him Peter, James, and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. Right? Like in verse 32, he was with all his disciples. 
And now he's taking just these three. And these three might look familiar because they got to experience something really cool with Jesus. They got to experience the transfiguration. Right? They got to see Jesus transfigured and Moses and Elijah there. And it was so incredible. They wanted to build altars and, and worship there. Right? But here we get to see in, 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 in verse 33, it says he took with them. And it says, and, and he began to be greatly distressed and troubled. Right? And he lets them know, y'all, this isn't going to be like the transfiguration. I am overwhelmed right now. I am distressed. Y'all, this is Jesus saying he has met his limit. Jesus is distressed and troubled. And y'all, here's the deal. Just because you're close to Jesus, and this is what, this is what, what Peter and James and John are in this moment, just because you're close to Jesus... It's not all glory and transfiguration, right? Sometimes we meet our limits even when we are close to Jesus. There is trouble and there is distress. Amen? Look at verse 34. Verse 34, and he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And so here's what he does. He tells them to watch, right? And then he goes a little bit further by himself. And the position that he takes is one of distress, right? He, he collapses to the ground, right? Because, because he has met his limit. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in just a minute. But, but here's what it does. Sometimes when we meet our limits, that's all we can do is just collapse right I had a, a friend of mine once who was going through a really nasty divorce and she told her counselor she said I I can't do anything and he looked at her and he goes you don't have to do anything right now the scripture talks about God is a shield around you Rest under his shield right now. You see, sometimes when we meet our limits, all we can do is, is collapse. You see, as he looks ahead to what's going to happen, he meet, Jesus meets his limits. And then Mark tells us what he prays when he's there by himself. In verse 36, he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will but what you will. Right now we're going to spend a little bit of time on this because, because what this is, Jesus does this thing called a prayer of lament. Right In the Psalms, there's these Psalms of lament. You can, you can Google them and it'll pull them up and you can read them. They all follow this kind of same pattern. But what a lament is, it is this time where we get to see the truth of God and we get to express to him the truth of the pain in our life. And we enter into that as a place of worship. And that is what Jesus does. Right? He says, Abba, Father. And, and he, he declares to God this, this very intimate, intimate connection with God. Right? He says, Abba, Father. And Abba is this term that, that when a baby is growing up, it's oftentimes like one of the first words they speak because it means daddy. It means, it means, it means father, but it is this, this term of endearment. It's not this formal, Jesus doesn't use this formal term of, 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 of father dear. He doesn't, he doesn't use this righteous term, our father who out, art in heaven. He's, he's done that before, but here it is this personal connection with God. Now, y'all, when, when I was little, I had very vivid dreams when I was a kid. Like, I would have dreams that there were snakes in my bed, and I would wake up and see them. And lose my mind. And go screaming down the hallway. Right? I remember one time waking up thinking that, that uh, I had a bottle of shampoo, and I opened it, and it let out uh, yellow jackets in my room. Right, And one of them was in my hair. And so I woke up and I just started hitting my, my head because it was in my hair. And I could feel it in my hair. That's what I mean. I had very vivid dreams. And I remember my, my dad coming to my room because they heard me screaming. And, 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 and well, now that I'm an adult, I realize my mom probably heard me screaming and sent my dad is probably what happened. But, 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 but all I know is my dad came into my room. 
right? And he sat down by my bed, and I just threw my arms around him. And like I remember shaking, and I remember putting my head like, like in his neck, you know, just, just covering my face with him. And I remember him just rubbing my back and saying that, that it's okay that he's here. He said, I'm okay. it's okay, I'm here. You just had a dream. I'm okay, you're okay, I'm, I'm here. You just had a dream. You see, in that moment, my father wasn't this distant person down the, the hallway. He was my daddy. This is what Jesus does. As he declares to God that, that he is his daddy, he is his Abba. You see, when we meet our limits, we get to meet an intimate personal God, right? We get to cry out to a God who is close by. And then Jesus says this. He says, all things are possible for you. You see, Jesus knows who God really is. He has no question who God is, right? He knows the power of God, and and, and he doesn't question it. As a matter of fact, he knows the power of God, and he declares it in this prayer. All things are possible for you. Everything is possible for you. And in, a, in, the, in, the, in the laments in the scriptures, we see this. We see this declaration of the truth of God. We see this intimate connection with God. We see this true declaration of the truth of God in these moments where, where we meet our limits. We see this banner raised of who God really is. You see, when we meet our limits, this is what we get to do in a prayer of lament. We get to declare the truth of God. We get to declare the truth of who God is. We get to to declare the the truth of his character. Why? Because we need to know it. Because it's real easy to think when the bills pile up and you don't have enough money for the ones you got, and then the other one comes in, this is the time where God's going to prove he's not faithful. Right? You're going to be the exception to the entire uh, race of humanity, of the faithfulness of God, that God is going to forget you. That's what it feels like, isn't it? And we need to remember the, the truth and need to declare the truth of who God is. Then Jesus says, remove this cup from me. Now here's what's beautiful. He has this intimate connection with God. He declares the truth about who God is. And then Jesus gets to, gets to, gets to let God know what's really going on in this heart, Right? In a lament, we see this, not only this true declaration of the truth of God, but we see, we see this true declaration of what's going on in our hearts and souls and bodies. Now, here's the deal. Jesus is both fully God and fully human. And what he's doing is in his humanity, he is looking ahead to the crucifixion. And he knows he's got to go through the the crucifixion so that we can have the resurrection. But he's looking at the crucifixion and he's like, that is a lot. And that is going to hurt. And when he says, God, all things are possible for you, take this cup from me. He's like, God, listen, if there is a plan B, I need to know it right now. Because I will gladly take it. If I can have the resurrection to remove sin without the pain, my humanity is screaming out, yes. Nobody wants to sign up for that kind of pain voluntarily. The thought of of this being right around the corner has Jesus at his limit. See, when we meet our limits, we get to be honest with God. Now, here's the deal. We all wear certain masks. Right? We all wear these masks in our life that, that honestly, sometimes they help us get through life. Sometimes they help us get through the day. But here's what you see when you've met your, your limits. Like, like you could have this mask of, of I've got it all together. Right? And so when stuff hits me, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. But your anxiety is so high, uh, you, you suffer from chronic ulcers, you suffer from, from, from severe anxiety, and yet you're telling everybody, no, it's fine, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I got it all together, right? Maybe your mask is just the opposite about that, yeah, I don't care about anything, right? Whatever happens, happens, right? But you do care. Maybe your mask is, I'll do whatever it takes to make you happy. 
Maybe your mask is, I don't want to be alone. And I'll do whatever it takes so that I don't have to be alone. And that's the mask. But here's the deal. When we meet our limits, masks begin to come off. And we get to see what's, what's really there and what's, what's really inside. And when they do, we get to be honest with God. Which is what Jesus does. And then he says, yet not what I will, but what you will. Now here's the deal. This is the final part of this lament. It is this place of acceptance. It is this place of surrender, right? He knows God intimately. He knows the truth about God. He has declared the, the truth of, of, of his life. He's at his limit. And he says, but God, if there's a plan B, let me know. But if there's a plan A, and that's the only plan that there is, then I will gladly take it from you because I know you are good and I know all things are possible. And if you could give me a different way, you would. Your will be done, not mine. And he surrenders. One of the, the commentators I read say, listen, it is okay to expect power if you are willing to accept suffering. It is okay to expect power if you are willing to surrender to God, even if that means suffering. See, when we meet our limits, we get to surrender to God. And y'all got to tell you, this is the hardest part, isn't it? Because I love the idea of a daddy God, right? Mm, doesn't that feel good? I mean, I'm sitting up here drinking warm tea. Doesn't that just feel like a warm cup of tea in your hands? Like God is close and so good. I love the idea of the, 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 the truth of who God is. I love the idea about being honest with God. But when it comes to surrender, right? That one's harder. When it comes to surrender, self-centeredness, that one's hard. I think I've told this before, uh, but when our kids were little, we would teach them this little mantra to obey. We'd say, right away and all the way and with a happy heart, right? Right away, all the way and with a happy heart. That's what obedience is. And we thought we were being great parents and all this stuff. <laughs> I'm sure we were. And I'm sure you are too. But one day, one of our kids looked at us and they go, you know, right away all the way I get, but a happy heart's really hard. <laughs> right? Because surrender is hard, isn't it? It is hard. Well, it's so hard, we probably respond more like the disciples do as this unfolds. Because look at what happens in verse 37. So Jesus prays this prayer. And it says, and he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you, could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit, is de it, the spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It's enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise and let us be going. See, the betrayer is at hand. You see, instead of watching and, and praying, he found them sleeping and resting. They, too, had met their limits. Like, physically, their body had met their limits. They were too tired. They were too relaxed. Keep in mind, if they, if they had just come from a Passover meal, which most people think that that's what they were celebrating was a Passover meal, they probably would have had three or four glasses of wine over a very long dinner. So it's understandable that they were fairly relaxed, right? Their bodies were tired. Right? But in them we see this common response that's like this mushy olive pulp waste. Right? When we meet our limits, we can rely on our own strength instead. Right? Instead of this prayer of lament, we can, we can rely on our own strength. You see, the disciples had one command. Watch, right? stay awake, and pray. And their immediate response was like, stay awake, that's easy. I stay awake many hours during the day. Right? What's a few more? I got you, Jesus. You go do your thing. We'll sit here. We'll watch. We'll watch from Moses and Elijah to come back because, you know, we know you like to do that when you step away. So it's fine. We'll be, and then they're sound asleep. Right? Right? You see, when trusting in our strength, it says this when we meet our limits. It says, I can do this. I can do this. 
Yet Jesus said, our spirit is willing. That's right. Like, 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 that's coming from your spirit. Yes, I got this. But the reality is your humanity is weak. Your flesh is weak. Your strength is weak. The, the, the truth is you can't do this alone. You weren't even designed to do this alone. And if you have Jesus, why not go through whatever it is with his strength? Watch this, verse 43. It says, and immediately while he was speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, no one, uh, the one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up and at once said, Rabbi, and he kissed him, which, by the way, was a common way to greet someone. And they laid hands on him and seized him. Right? So Judas, we already know, had met his limit. We saw him meet his limit last week when, as Mark wrote it, this unnamed woman woman came up to Jesus and anointed him with oil. And and, and he reframed that as this this act of worship. And he talked about how she was really the one who understood what was happening next because she was preparing him for his funeral, right? She was preparing him for his burial. And that's when Judas said, you know what? Enough. Enough. I signed up for a Messiah that was going to kick Rome out of Israel. I signed up for a savior that was going to restore us to our rightful place as the the kingdom of God on earth. Right? He had enough. And in Judas, we see this. We see that when we meet our limits, we can rely on our own plans because Judas had a plan. His plan was, let's get this Jesus arrested. Get him out of the way so the new Messiah can show up we got to make room for the real Messiah, the real Savior. Because this one isn't lining up with who I think the Messiah needs to be. And we can rely on our own plans. Verse 47 says this. But one of these who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and, and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and yet you did not seize me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. See, here's the deal. When we meet our limits, we can rely on our emotions. Right? Because one of the disciples, we we learn from a, a, a different gospel that it is Peter. Right? He grabs his sword and he cuts off an approaching soldier's ear. Right? Right, and, 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 But yet even here, Jesus says, guys, 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 listen, all you people, listen. This is what God said was going to happen. The scriptures must be fulfilled. And here's what, what this disciple heard. This disciple heard, obviously you need my help. Obviously it's my job to protect the son of God with my sword. And so I'll just go ahead and chop off an ear, and then they'll all go away. Right? We also learn from another gospel what Jesus did is either he picked up the ear, dusted it off, or it was hanging there, we're not sure, and he put it back on and healed it. Right? Because Jesus doesn't need our help. But what we see in this disciple's response is we see that, 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 that in this moment, when he met his limit, he responded impulsively, which what we know about Peter lines up, doesn't it? And this is what he did, and, and, and yet Jesus said, this is what the scriptures say is going to happen. Now here's the deal, when we meet our limits, our emotions can have a really loud voice. And y'all hear me, I am a counselor, I love to counsel people, I'm a big proponent of emotions. I think God gave them to us, and I think they are a gift, and they are a way to connect with God. But when we meet our limits... Our emotions can have a louder voice than the truth of God, just like they did here. And that is the way we can tend to respond. You see, when when our emotions contradict the word of God, then our emotions are off. And we have to acknowledge that. I'm not saying don't feel them. I'm not saying that they are wrong. I am saying what is the grid you're running them through? 
Because Jesus wanted them to know this is what God has planned. This is God's plan A. There's one more temptation. And they all left him and fled. Then Mark adds this little one. He says, and a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. So it's like he had just woken up from sleep. And they seized him and he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. So, what's the temptation here? I don't need suggestions. All right, here's, here's what Jesus just said, right? Jesus just said, the scriptures will be fulfilled. Amos 2.16 says this, in that day, even the bravest warriors will flee naked. What's Mark saying? Mark is showing us, yep. Yeah, The scriptures are being fulfilled. Right? Jesus said the scriptures are being fulfilled, and they are. But here we see when we meet our limits, here's what we can do. Just like all the disciples did, and just like this guy did, we can rely on isolation. We can want to escape. We can want to do things on our own. We can want to get away. We can want to isolate. Because all the disciples knew is that it's better for me to be away from him right now than it is to be with him. And they fled. And so on Gethsemane, we see that olive is pressed into oil and it's pressed into the stuff that is good for just mushy waste. But with Jesus, we see this prayer of lament. And so, so here's what we're going to do. I want to walk through what this prayer of lament is just real quick as a reminder. Uh, we're going to take communion and then... Uh, Well, I'll save that for just a minute. All right, so the prayer of lament is this. With Jesus, here's what we get to know in in these times when we meet our limits. One, we get to know that we have an intimate Father in God, right? He is not distant even when he feels distant. Y'all, for those of you who have struggled with depression, you know one of the spiritual symptoms of depression is that God feels distant, doesn't he? He is not distant. He is close by. We get to declare the truth of who God is. We get to enjoy the freedom of being honest with God. And by God's goodness and grace, maybe you will have people in your life that stay awake and watch and pray and are there with you to be honest with God and honest with them. And then we get to surrender. So here's what I want you to do. The way we do communion here, if you're a follower of Jesus, you are welcome to partake in communion. You don't have to be just a member. Um, And uh, what I want you to do before you come down to the table is I want you to take a a couple of minutes, however much time you need. Maybe you already know. And I want to know, what is that place where you have met your limits? What is the most recent place, what is the biggest place where you are meeting your limits? And when you're ready, I want you to come down. And one of our elders, I think we have three elders and I'm the fourth. Yeah, so, so y'all come on down. They will uh, serve communion to you. Uh, the little plate is gluten-free. So if you need a gluten-free cracker, just let them know when you come down. They'll give you the elements. I want everybody to go back to your seat And then, as part of communion, we are going to go through a prayer of lament together. And I want us to practice this before we go out, because here's what I know. We are all going to hit our limits. And I want us to know how to to have this prayer of lament in our back pocket. All right? So let me pray for us. When you're ready, come down and get the elements. Go back. The easiest way this works, come down the middle and go back to your seat out uh, the side. Because we got a big crowd, so it'll... It'll flow, all right? Let me pray for us. Jesus, as we come to this table, in your name, I pray that this table represents everything that is found in this prayer of yours. It represents that we have a God who is close to us. It represents we have a God who is true. It represents this God can handle anything we bring to him. And he is worthy of our surrender. And Jesus, I pray if there's anybody here or anybody watching online who hasn't said yes to you, then today would be the day that they do that. And as they come to this table, it would be their first public profession of their faith. 
In Christ's name we pray, amen. Whenever you're ready, come on down and grab the elements. Okay, right where you are, I want us to pray this prayer of lament. All right, we're going to take a few minutes. I've already told Fellowship Kids this might be a little longer service, so they're ready. Because they're the ones that feel it the most, by the way. Um, um, I know your stomach's saying you're hungry. Trust me, down the hall, it's getting crazy, all right? It's fine. Maybe that's where you meet your limits too, right? But here's what I want us to do. I want us to close our eyes, and, and, and if you can, I, I think it could be even appropriate to um, get on our knees together. Um, and, and because this is the position that Jesus took. He was, he was flat on the ground, and he had met his limits, right? Yeah, yeah. Or sit in your seat, too. If, if getting on your knees is easy, but getting up's the hard part, just stay where you are, all right? Like, it's fine. It's fine. But if you can, or, or hold your hands out, whatever, just take a, a, a position of prayer. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a minute, and, and I want us to, to go through a prayer of lament. And, and, and I want us to do this because I know this is a common experience where we all meet our limits. So what I want you to do is I want you to start off with this intimate God. And you know how... On your cell phone, when you have five bars, you're like, this is going to be good, right? Where is that five-bar moment with God? Where are you when you are the most intimate with God and God is the most intimate with you? Then in your mind and in your soul, go to that place. And there, meet with Abba God. Meet with the God who is the parent that maybe you didn't have. Right, And in that place, let's declare a truth about God. And this is where I want us to take a minute or two and, 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 and from where you are, tell us a truth about God. Because I bet as a congregation, we need to hear the truth that the Spirit is speaking to you. And so tell us what is true about this intimate God of ours. Like, say it out loud, y'all. Like, somebody. Counselor. He's kind. I think I heard he's available. He's love. He's constant. Yeah, keep it going. Mm-hmm. Gentle, yeah. Yeah, compassionate. Now to yourself, tell God what it is that has you at your limits right now. Jesus looked at somebody he was going to heal and he said, what do you want me to do for you? Right now God is with you and he's saying, what do you want me to do? And to yourself and in your spirit, tell him.
And then let's do what Jesus did. And what we'll do is we'll declare together this place of surrender. Just like Jesus did, yet not what I will, but what you will. And so from that place of surrender, let's say, Jesus, not what I will, but what you will. And with that surrender, let's take the elements together. His body broken for us. And his blood shed for us. Jesus, not our will, but your will be done. You are our plan A. In Christ's name I pray, amen. And praise the Lord, my voice stayed. As we keep in our minds that place of surrender, like prayer said, like Fred said, where our best prayers take us, that moment. We think of the place where Jesus surrendered as we remembered where his body was broken, his blood was poured out. We sing this together. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands. our hope this morning, that in the midst of suffering, in the midst of persecution and hurt and pain and times of depression and loneliness, we know that Jesus is a good high priest who recognizes our pain, our hurt, that he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he came and humbled.
humbled himself to the point of a servant, even death on a cross. And so when we sing about him returning and us meeting him, we can remember the words that he said, that blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And because of what he did on the cross, that we one day will get to see Jesus in his fullness and his glory, and he'll take us to the Father where we can commune with him forever. So let's sing that again. said where two or more are gathered in your name that you're there. Well, we got a few more than two and we know that you're here with us right now. So as we prepare to leave this place, to go to work, job, camp, school, whatever it is, Jesus, we ask that you go with us and that we can take with us this connection of heaven and earth to a broken, hurting world and that we get to see your prayer that you taught us to pray come true, that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, my name is Amy Hinch, and I'm the Connections Director here. If I haven't met you, I'd love to meet you on the way out. But part of my job is stewarding our serve value. So every once in a while, I'll give a brief update of what God is doing in and through this church and in through your contributions. I want to share one um, area with you today. This will not take long. Um, but I want to share with you what we as a church are doing internationally. Um, so, unfortunately, there was a horrible tragedy, as most of you have heard, in Turkey last month. Um, so, because of your contributions, we were able to give $1,000 um, toward a search and rescue team from Hungary that was helping with that. Um, so, thank you for that. I haven't got a full update yet, but I just want to let you know that through your contributions, we are helping folks across the world. Um, the second international thing is I want to give you an update. Last April, you may have heard me if you were here, and if not, um, welcome. Um, we were able to give a significant amount of money toward Bold Hope, and that was specifically for the area of Alta Via. Alta Via is a place that we go and visit on mission trips in the Dominican Republic. Um, so the prayer over the last year was for Bold Hope to be able to purchase some plots of land so that they can build a community center there. The fortunate thing that I want to celebrate with you guys is that they have bought the land. As you can see behind me, um, yeah, it was great. Um, because of not only your contributions, fellowship, but internationally, the contributions that have gone to Bold Hope to buy this piece of land, um, they were able to buy six plots of land. Um, within this community that's a transitional community. So as you can tell, they broke ground a few weeks ago for this um, community center. Um, it's going to be a three-story community center that will house some Bold Hope offices, which they have not had. But bigger than that, it's going to house a school. 
um, and water uh, for the community. So thank you for being part of that. If you want to learn more about what it means and what we're doing in Alta Via, there is a mission trip interest meeting March 19th, so in a few weeks. Um, we're going to take a trip. is set for October 7th through 13th. Um, medical folks in the room, it's a medical-specific trip, but don't turn that out. Uh, don't tune me out if you're not medically inclined at all because there seriously is something for everyone. We need people to play with kids as their parents are getting checked on. So if you're interested at all in going to the Dominican Republic for a week on a short missions trip, please let me know. You can email me, amy at fellowshipashville.com, Penn State students. This includes you. If you want to go, you are more than welcome to go with us. Folks that are here from Asheville, we have an interest meeting in a few weeks. So go online, fellowshipashville.com, to sign up. If you have questions, come see me after the service. Um, now, if you have sat down, we're going to stand up and sing the doxology and then go from there. Let's close out. And we've got a lot of... A lot of voices in here, so let me just say, we will sing the amen today, okay? <laughs> we never really know. It's kind of been a social experiment to see if anybody leads it. No one has, but we're going to sing the amen, all right? Ready? Praise God from who? Thank you for worshiping with us today. We'll see you guys soon. Have a great week.